5G coverage surpasses 80% ahead of target. Additional contribution incentive to EPF members. Salam Malaysia Madani, I'm Daryl Baptist and you're watching Malaysia Tonight. The national 5G network has reached a total of 80.2% coverage of populated areas as of 31st December. Communications Minister Fami Fadil said the coverage rate development is in line with the projection by Prime Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim while tabling budget 2024 last year. He added that a special task force will hold a meeting this Friday to determine the next course of action for the 5G coverage initiative. The meeting will be chaired by the Treasury Secretary General Dato Johan Mahmoud Murikan and Communication Ministry's Secretary General Dato Muhammad Fauzi Muhammad Isa. Selepas ini, keputusan daripada task force itu akan dimaklumkan semula kepada Jemaah Menteri dan kita jangka dalam tempoh yang tidak terlalu lama pihak kerajaan akan menimbangkan untuk mengumum peralihan dari satu rangkaian borong single wholesale network menjadi dua rangkaian dual network dan pengumuman ini akan dibuat selepas jemaah menteri menimbang kemudian He said this in a media conference at his ministry in Putrajaya today the Cabinet today decided to place Digital National Berhad, or DNB, and Cyber Security Malaysia, CSM, under the Digital Ministry. Fami Fadil, who is also the Unity Government spokesman, said the Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Commission, MCMC, remains with the Communications Ministry. Sebelum ini, Cyber Security Malaysia dimaklumkan uh, di letak bawah uh, Jabatan Perdana Menteri Tapi Perdana Menteri telah setuju bahawa aspek-aspek korporat kerja-kerja berkaitan dengan syarikat-syarikat swasta ini boleh diteruskan dan sesuai untuk diletakkan di bawah Kementerian Digital. Also placed under the Digital Ministry is the Malaysian Administrative Modernization and Management Planning Unit, aka MAMPU. Fami, who is Communications Minister, said Mimos Berhad, which was under the Prime Minister's Department, JPM, would return to the Science, Technology and Innovation Ministry, MOSTI. However, the function of digital ID pioneered by Mimos through the Malaysia Digital Economy Blueprint, My Digital, initiative will temporarily remain with JPM, but will be managed by the Digital Ministry after the system is fully implemented in March. The Independent Police Conduct Commission or IPCC will act as an independent oversight commission to monitor the police force and respond to reports on the matter. Home Minister Dato Sri Saifuddin Nasution Ismail said the establishment of the commission was proof of the government's efforts to maintain and reinforce the public perception towards the credibility of the police. Kita percaya IPCC ini bila di, di berjalan, uh, dia tentu saja akan uh, meningkatkan lagi uh, integriti dari kalangan pasukan polis. Kemudian uh, uh, IPCC ini juga dari masa ke semasa akan menasihati kerajaan dan membuat sure mengenai langkah yang sesuai diambil untuk uh, meningkatkan dan menambah baik element integrity di dalam pasukan enforcement agency yang terbesar di negara kita. Jazamuddin Ahmad Nawawi, who formerly helmed the Prime Minister's Department, JPM Advisory Board, has been named Deputy Chairman of IPCC. Meanwhile, former Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, MACC Senior Director, Tan Kang Sai, former Bukit Aman Logistics and Technology Department Deputy Director, Shukri Abdullah, and former National Audit Department Financial Sector Director Martina Kartina Zamhari were announced as IPCC members. Police have received a total of 75 police reports nationwide. 
from representatives of political parties with regards to the, to the Dubai move, an alleged political movement meant to topple the unity government led by Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim. The reports were made by 31 representatives of political parties, while the remaining 44 were made by members of the public. Bukit Aman Criminal Investigations Department Director Dato Suri Mohammad Shuhaili Mohammad Zain said all the reports were received nationwide as of 7 a.m. this morning. On Tuesday, Inspector General of Police, or the IGP, Tansri Razaruddin Hussein said that police reports were made based on a video recording of three or four people that went viral believed to be actively plotting to disrupt parliamentary democracy. Following the reports, police made follow-up actions to appease the public concern and maintain security. Police have smashed an international drug trafficking syndicate from sharing information with Hong Kong Narcotics Bureau and seized various chemicals and drugs worth 7.89 million ringgit. Bukit Aman Narcotics Crime Investigation Department Director Dato Sri Mohammad Kamaruddin Mat Din said in a raid on a condominium in the capital last Friday, the police arrested a local man, a Hong Kong resident and a Mongolian woman aged between 25 and 48 years old. In an operation on the same day, the Hong Kong Narcotics Bureau, according to him, arrested a 26-year-old local man and woman believed to be involved in drug trafficking activities on the island. Modus operandi yang digunakan sindiket ini adalah menjadikan premis kediaman sebagai tempat pembungkusan sebelum diedarkan untuk pasaran Hong Kong. Yang mana dadah-dadah ini akan dibungkus, dimasukkan dalam patung ini dan akan diedar melalui korea sini. He said in a special press conference at the Kuala Lumpur Police Headquarters today. All the suspects were investigated in accordance with Section 39B of the Dangerous Drug Act 1952 and were remanded for seven days, from 6th to 12th January, to assist investigation. focuses to become Asia's leading travel and aviation services group. The Employees Provident Fund, or known as EPF, today announced the disbursement of 708 million ringgit government additional contribution incentive to its 1.4 million members aged between 40 and under 55. The incentive was allocated to individuals with EPF savings of 10,000 ringgit and below in their account one as of 24th February 2023. Elaborating further, in a release statement, EPF said the one-off 500 ringgit contribution incentive, which was announced during the tabling of Budget 2023 on 24 February 2023, seeks to encourage EPF members with low savings and nearing retirement age to continue to save and accelerate the accumulation of their retirement savings. The statement added that it aligns seamlessly with EPF's overarching purpose to elevate savings adequacy and contribute significantly to the broader social societal goal of building a resilient financial future. For more information on the government additional contribution incentive, members can refer to the frequently asked questions available on the EPF website or contact the EPF Contact Management Centre. Malaysia Aviation Group, MAG, will be focusing on three core principles in 2024 as it aspires to become Asia's leading travel and aviation services group. MAG Group Managing Director Dato Captain Isham Ismail said the group will elevate its efforts to improve its cabin comfort as well as its in-flight dining experiences and refine its overall service delivery to its passengers. While we know change is inevitable, which is part of our progress, what remains unwavering in our commitment to deliver the unique essence of Malaysian hospitality. This is deeply ingrained in our DNA and into every facet of our operations. 
MAG today also unveiled their new uniform for frontliners of its ground handling arm, Aero Darat Services, also known as ADS, which embraces modernity into its design while maintaining tributes to the cultural roots of Malaysia. Dato Izam said the new ADS ground uniform symbolizes their commitment to professionalism and equity, while also appreciating the country's vibrance and culture with the inclusion of the Songket motif embedded in the design. He said the newly introduced ground uniform seamlessly combines style and practicality with a focus on diversity to suit ADS's role in serving a range of aviation services for all airlines under MAG, as well as foreign carriers flying into domestic airports in Malaysia. The government will not arbitrarily allow the implementation of the progressive wage policy, but will instead take into account the ability of employers and the current state of the country's economy. Economy Minister Rafizi Ramli said that was because the implementation of the policy was voluntary and involved incentives from the government. Ambil kira juga kemampuan syarikat, majikan dan ekonomi kita sebab majikan yang terbesar dalam negara kita ni sebenarnya uh, perusahaan mikro kecil dan sederhana 97% daripada majikan kita dari 97% daripada uh, entiti perniagaan di negara kita ini ialah PMKS. Kalau kita nak wajibkan saja ada yang akan gulung tikar uh, daripada kita nak naikkan gaji ada yang hilang pekerjaan. According to Rafizi, his ministry and the Human Resources Ministry only focus on private sector salaries, while the study of the Public Service Remuneration System, or SSPA, is managed by Prime Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim. He noted that the progressive wage policy has a different challenge. It's not just a matter of money, but it's also how the government wants to convince employers to raise wages gradually. He said this after officiating the grant presentation ceremony under the People's Income Initiative, also known as IPR program, and the town hall session with the student leadership of University Technology Mara, UITM, Selangor branch at UITM Puncha Alam on Tuesday. The level of unemployment in the country has dropped to 3.3% last December, similar to that of pre-pandemic levels. Chief Statistician Dato Sri Dr. Muhammad Uzir Mahidin said the labour performance in the country has shown improvement as evidence of the positive growth of the current economy. The amount of labour strength continues to record 0.2% month-on-month to 17 million people. In a release statement, the labour participation rate for November 2023 remained at 70.1%, the same as the previous month. Meanwhile, the unemployment rate dropped by 0.3% to 569.2 thousand people. Based on the current growth of the economic sector, almost all sectors have recorded a positive growth of residents working, except for the agricultural sector. For the first 11 months of 2023, the national labour market showed a stable growth momentum, despite some challenges faced during the floods. Holiday seasons is expected to continue boosting the economy, especially in the tourism sector. As such, the national labour market landscape is projected to continue remaining strong in the upcoming months in line with the currently increasing performance of the national economy. MIDF research said the labour market in Malaysia is expected to strengthen further in 2024 and 2025, backed by encouraging momentum in the domestic economy and recovery in external trade. In a note today, the research house forecasts the average jobless rate at 3.4% in 2024 and 3.3% in the following year. The note also said the return of non-citizen workers is expected to boost overall employment and reduce the jobless rate. MIDF research said that as of the third quarter of 2023, non-citizens' employment is almost 0.8% lower than pre-pandemic levels. The research house said that Malaysia's labour market continued on an improving trend as the unemployment rate registered a new post-pandemic low of 3.30% in November 2023 while the labour force and employment growth rates continued on a moderating pace of 1.7% year-on-year and 2.0% year-on-year respectively. 
It further expects average job vacancies to hover at the 100,000 to 150,000 per month level for 2024 amid external trade recovery and resilient domestic demand. FGV Holdings Berhard has reimbursed 72.2 million ringgit in recruitment fees to its 19,673 migrant workers in its efforts to modify the Withhold Release Order, or WRO, issued by the United States Customs and Border Protection, also known as CBP. The plantation company, in a release statement on its website, said it has allocated 112 million ringgit to reimburse recruitment fees to its migrant workers, including former migrant workers. The reimbursements were made in three tranches, paid in March, June and September 2023 respectively. It said FGV has given top priority to implement a remediation plan to uphold labor rights and address any gaps in its labor practices. A key component of FGV's remediation program is the reimbursement of recruitment fees imposed on its migrant workers by third-party recruitment agencies. On the completion of the reimbursement program for its current workers, FGV appointed Global Assurance Partner LRQA to conduct a verification of the reimbursement exercise. Still ahead, 13 arrested for breaking into TV channel during live broadcast. Police in Ecuador said they have arrested several armed men who broke into the set of a public television channel Tuesday during a live broadcast and forced the staff to lie and sit on the floor as shots and yelling were heard in the background. Ecuador's police chief Cesar Augusto Zapata said on X that the police operation at TC Television left 13 people arrested with weapons, explosives and other evidence. Zapata confirmed that the hostages were released and taken to safety and described the incident as a terrorist act. Shortly after the masked armed men interrupted the live broadcast, President Daniel Naboa issued a decree declaring the country had entered an internal armed conflict. The decree designated 22 drug trafficking gangs operating in the country as terrorist groups. The declaration of an internal conflict occurred one day after Naboa declared a state of emergency for 60 days throughout Ecuador due to a serious prison and security crisis that the country is experiencing. The decision was made after one of the country's most dangerous gang leaders was reported missing from a prison on Monday, triggering a series of riots in at least six prisons in the country. The death toll from a magnitude 7.6 earthquake that hit the Noto Peninsula of Japan's west coast exceeded 200 as cold weather hampered search efforts for those still missing on Wednesday. Police and rescue workers were seen on Wednesday morning searching through the rubble of collapsed buildings. Cold and heavy rain were forecast in the region, with the highest temperature expected to reach 4 degrees Celsius in the city of Wajima. According to Japan's Defense Ministry, the government has deployed 6,300 soldiers from the self-defense force to quake-hit areas, and a large-scale search operation had started in severely hit areas on Tuesday. As of Wednesday morning, 203 people were confirmed dead, with 68 still missing, according to the local government of Ishikawa Prefecture. The figure, however, has fluctuated daily as the Ishikawa Prefecture government is continuing to release the names of those it cannot reach, even if it has no evidence that they have been affected by the quake. Over 26,000 people remain in evacuation centers, while some 3,100 residents are still cut off due to damaged roads, according to the Prefecture government.
Coming up in sports, men's and mixed doubles through to next round at Malaysia Open. Stay with us. Jago, Jago Badminton Dunia. Kini bertumpu di Malaysia. Look at the elevation. Terrific. Dalam memburu takhta berprestij badminton dunia. Nantikan aksi-aksi sengit jago-jago badminton negara dalam kejohanan badminton Petronas terbuka Malaysia hanya di RTM. Former world champions Aaron Chia So Wui Yik survived an early scare as they beat Denmark's Frederick Sogard and Rasmus Kjaja in the men's doubles today to reach the Malaysia Open last 16. Despite a slow start that had them trailing 12-4 in the opening game, third-seeded Aaron Wui Yik ra rallied for a hard-fought 2022 21-13, 21-13 win, much to the joy of thousands thousands of fans at the Axiata Arena. Aaron Wu Yik's triumph paved the way for an all-Malaysian last 16 clash against Noor Izzedin Rumsani, Go Zifei, ensuring at least one Malaysian pair in Friday's quarterfinals. Izzedin Zifei had earlier eliminated Thailand's Supa Jomko, Kitty Nupong Kedron, 21-17, 22-20. Elsewhere, mixed doubles duo Chen Tang Ji, To Yi Wei are through to the second round of the tournament. Tang Ji, Yi Wei provided some cheer for local fans at the Axiata Arena when they ousted France's Tom Jiquel, Delphine Del Rue 21-17, 21-18 in the opening round. Tang Ji, Yi Wei were among the only Malaysian players to reach the last eight in last year's edition. Chelsea suffered a surprising 1-0 loss at second-tier Middlesbrough in the first leg of their League Cup semi-final with Hayden Hackney's goal, giving Mauricio Pochettino's wasteful side plenty to do in the return. The 21-year-old Hackney's silky finish from an Isaiah Jones pass stunned the visitors in the 37th minute at the Riverside Stadium and the hosts defended superbly to take a slender advantage to Stamford Bridge. Chelsea only had themselves to blame though as they dominated possession but squandered a host of chances. The biggest culprit being Cole Palmer who failed to hit the target twice in the opening half with the goal gaping. Borough, who won the trophy in 2004 but are currently 12th in the championship, had chances on the counter-attack to increase their lead but will still head to London believing they can reach Wembley. Chelsea's players were booed by some of their own fans at the final whistle, with Thiago Silva acting as peacemaker, but they will be confident of making amends in the second leg on 23rd January. Liverpool hosts Fulham in the first leg of the other semi-final later Wednesday. RB Leipzig striker Timo Werner has joined Tottenham Hotspur on loan until the end of the season with an option to buy. This was announced by the Premier League club in a statement released on Tuesday. The 27-year-old returns to the English top flight after a two-year stint at Chelsea where he made 89 appearances and scored 23 goals and helped the team claim the Champions League, UEFA Super Cup and the club World Cup titles. The German international returned to his former team Leipzig in 2022 but has only made eight Bundesliga appearances this season. Werner could provide cover for Spurs up front with the club's top scorer Son Hyun Ming away at the Asian Cup for South Korea. Spurs are currently fifth in the Premier League standings with 39 points, six behind leaders Liverpool. The delayed 2023 Africa Cup of Nations, also known as AFCON, kicks off in Ivory Coast on Saturday. The 34th edition of the tournament was originally scheduled to be held between June and July 2023, so African players would not miss any matches with their clubs. However, the Confederation of African Football, also known as CAF, changed their plans after concerns were raised about adverse weather conditions as a result of Ivory Coast's rainy season. 
The hosts open the tournament on Saturday when they take on Guinea-Bissau in Group A at the new purpose-built Alasane Utara Stadium. After becoming the first African side to reach the semi-finals of a World Cup in Qatar in 2022, Morocco are the favourites to win the tournament, while Senegal are the defending champions. AFCON last came to Ivory Coast in 1984 and has not been back since. Back then, only two venues were used for an 18 tournament. For the first time during AFCON, VAR will be used during matches. Everything seems to be ready for the start of the tournament, something which Yassin Idris Diallo, president of the Ivorian Football Federation, affirms. Sebastian Loeb took stage four of the Dakar rally in Saudi Arabia as home favorite Yazid Al-Raji stretched his overall lead in the car category. Nine-time World Rally champion Loeb, racing a pro-drive hunter for the Bahrain Raid Extreme team, finished the 299km stage from al Salamia to the oasis city of al Hofuf one minute and eight seconds faster than Toyota's Al-Raji. Qatar's reigning champion Nasser al Atia, who had held a comfortable lead at the penultimate checkpoint, was third fastest in another pro drive hunter and moved up to third overall from fifth. Al Raji now leads Audi's Spanish Triple Dakar winner Carlos Sainz, fourth in Tuesday's stage by four minutes and 29 seconds. Loeb moved up to sixth overall from ninth, 23 minutes and 50 seconds off the lead after the 49-year-old's 24th career Dakar stage win and first this year. The Frenchman was also the fifth different stage winner, including the prologue in as many days. In the motorcycle category, Chilean Jose Ignacio Nacho Carnejo took over at the top after his second stage win of this year's event. Botswana's overnight leader, Ross Branch, reached the finish with twisted handlebars on his hero machine and losing nearly four and a half minutes to Cornejo, who leads him by a minute and 15 seconds. American Ricky Brabeck was third overall after finishing second in the stage. Kejohanan bola sepak Piala Asia Qatar 2023 mengupas prestasi semasa dan cabaran pasukan Harimau Melaya dalam mengembalikan era kegemilangan bola sepak Malaysia di benua Asia bersama pengacara Tengku Amril Norman dan tetamu jemputan bekas pemain kebangsaan Lim Chan Yew, Syed Admi Syed Hussein, tetamu dalam talian Datuk Haji Hamidin Haji Muhammad Amin, Presiden FAM dan pemain kebangsaan Safawi Rasid. Misi Doha, Jumaat 12 Januari 9 malam di Saluran Sukan RTM. Saksikan juga secara penstriman langsung di RTM Click bersama RTM, official media partner. That's it from us this evening in our top story. 5G coverage surpasses 80% ahead of target. My name is Daryl Baptist. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Thanks for watching.